In my beginning is my end. Now the light falls across the open field, leaving the deep lane shuttered with branches, dark in the afternoon, where you lean against a bank while a van passes and the deep lane insists on the direction into the village, in the electric heat hypnotized. In a warm haze, the sultry light is absorbed, not refracted by gray stone. The dahlias sleep in the empty silence, wait for the early hour. In that open field, if you do not come too close, if you do not come too close on a summer midnight, you can hear the music of the weak pipe and the little drum and see them dancing around the bonfire, the association of man and woman in dancing, signifying matrimony, a dignified and commodious sacrament, two and two necessary conjunction, holding each other by the hand or arm, which betokeneth concord. Round and round the fire, leaping through the flames, or joined in circles, rustically solemn or in rustic laughter, lifting heavy feet and clumsy shoes, earth feet, loam feet, lifted in country mirth, Mirth of those long since under the earth, nourishing the corn, keeping time, keeping the rhythm in their dancing, as in their living in the living seasons, the time of the seasons and the constellations, the time of milking and the time of harvest, the time of the coupling of man and woman and that of beasts, feet rising and falling, eating and drinking, dung and death. Dawn points and another day prepares for heat and silence. Out at the sea the dawn wind wrinkles and slides. I am here, or there, or elsewhere, in my beginning. East Coker Professing Literature, coming to you from Oklahoma City in the month of July, in the year of grace 2021. Professing Literature is the podcast where we take a piece of English literature and look at something small and go deep into it, considering how a piece of writing works by getting between the lines, the techniques, the illusions, the implications. We work across different literary genres and periods in the hopes of seeing a writer in action. My name is David Anderson, Associate Professor of Renaissance Literature at the University of Oklahoma, and with me as always is Eric Williams. How are you, Eric? Good morning, David. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm pretty well, thanks, Eric. It's good to be here again, good to be working with you, good to be continuing to move the ball with our podcast enterprise. It's exciting, and it feels good. It's been satisfying. And we've had some feedback that's been encouraging. Um, some of it's from my mother, but not all of it. Indeed. Indeed. And I think we're almost caught up. Um, yeah. I think we're in, you know, as we're releasing these episodes, there's references. I think we're in the 2021s now. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, yeah. Um, wow. Um, to, to be that current so that uh, yeah. the next episode released will actually have been recorded this year. That feels good. Uh, this this thing is coming together, and the world had better watch out. I think. Uh, well, um, I'll mention first of all. I know our listeners have heard me say this before, but you are more than welcome to rate us and review us on whatever podcast platform you prefer. We especially like the five star ratings. Don't be shy about laying those on us, and we have an email address. And you're welcome to send us comments or questions or thoughts. Eric, can you remind the listeners and me what the email address <laughs> is? Yes, it's professingliterature at protonmail.com. And Good. yeah, we've had quite a few people send stuff in, like, and you referenced the very encouraging. But yeah, we got some uh, really heartwarming things coming in from people. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. The idea here is... Uh, uh, I'm an academic. Um, I'm a college professor, 
but this podcast is not an academic conversation. I would like to think it's an intellectually serious conversation. But if you, the listener, are just interested in what we're talking about, if you've been reading some of the kind of things we're talking about and are interested in reading more, then you are our audience and that's who we want to talk to. So don't be shy about getting in touch. Um, and some of the people who get in touch are almost apologizing that they're approaching this stuff from, you know, f not from a professional literary critic's point of view, but that is valuable as far as I'm concerned. And so please pour it on. And uh, we look forward to these conversations. Um, Eric, I think one thing we need to do in terms of... Um, satisfying the audience is to just check in and see how the 4th of July went. We heard uh, in the last episode about your father-in-law's extravaganza of fireworks and patriotism that uh, is an annual event, and this was going to be the bounce back year following the pandemic. So just want to make sure that it was as spectacular as, as we hoped and that uh, no one lost a thumb or anything like that in a fireworks explosion. It, yeah, uh, nobody, nobody lost uh, any limbs. Nobody lost their minds. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, it went, it went really well. Uh, we blew up a lot of fireworks and had a lot of good food. It was, it was good. That's beautiful. Well, my wife and I had been hoping to attend, um, but um, we have collected too many children to uh, it just didn't work out that Sunday evening. So um, we were with you in spirit and we were getting some video from other people we know who were there and it looked like it would have been worthwhile. We actually, in our corner of Oklahoma City, we could see a bunch of fireworks going off for a couple of hours to the east of us. So we were just sitting in the backyard enjoying that. Uh, but it wasn't the same, I think, as what would have been going on um, in your father-in-law's neck of the woods. So maybe next yeah. year. What, uh, what, in your opinion, is the ultimate 4th of July food? Anything, anything exotic uh, or just the tried no. and true? Yeah, I mean, I think you can't go wrong with uh, grilling. I mean, you could just a uh, simple hot dog or, hmm. you know, sausages, kielbasa. Yeah. Uh, you, the, yeah, I think that you can't go wrong with that. And if you want to, if you really want to go extravagant, you can get some ribs. Yeah. This, that, is, this is barbecue country. Yeah. Um, and when I grew up in Canada, I thought a barbecue was something with a propane tank that you cook hot on. <laughs> And I moved here and learned that that is, in fact, a grill and a barbecue is something you cook slow and with smoke on. So I'm sorry if, yeah. if people um, are annoyed that I didn't know that. But yeah, the, the art of smoking meat is, uh, is taken seriously here. And yeah, ribs, um, ribs are about as good as it gets. Yeah. I also love, um, for me, uh, when it comes to the sausages, I love Italian sausages. And my hack um, to just raise the meal another half inch is to use a baguette rather than a hot dog bun. I mm. love that crusty French baguette yeah. that you maybe stick on the grill for a few minutes. Um, that works for me. I haven't uh, done that before, but, I, but I, I will be trying that this evening. Okay, well, good. That's... And listeners um, you know, can look forward to our Holiday Foods podcast, which we will uh, start working on um, no, this month. Indeed, because I indeed. think this is something we both take seriously and <laughs> feel passionate about. All right, well, glad that the fourth was a big success, and I hope it was um, for all of our listeners, or you know, if, if it's Canada Day or Bastille Day or... Uh, Queen Victoria's birthday or whatever it is uh, that you celebrate um, that uh, brings you closer to your country. Well, today we've uh, got some poetry for you, and this is going to be our first ever two-part episode because it seems likely to me that I'll have too much material to stick into one episode. And so we'll do this in two parts. We're talking about T.S. Eliot, so we're in the 20th century, and we're talking about one of his most famous poems, a very, very early poem written in 1910, 1911, and published in 1915, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So T.S. Eliot is a familiar name. 
although he's a difficult writer, and so a lot of people, I think, have heard of him but have not read him or maybe only are haunted by memories of reading Prufrock or a little bit of The Wasteland from high school or their undergraduate days. Eliot is maybe the most important literary figure in the English-speaking world in what we think of as the modernist age, modernist with a capital M, so roughly the first half of the 20th century. There are a couple of figures who rival him for that title. James Joyce would certainly be one, and maybe Virginia Woolf. But as a poet, Eliot really defined the era in many ways and moved English poetry in directions that were really definitive. Eliot was an American, not just an American, but a Midwesterner. He grew up not so very far from where we are recording in central Oklahoma. He grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, his family were from Boston. They were an old Boston family, but they, his branch of the family resettled in Missouri. He moved to England, however, in his early 20s and really became identified for the rest of his life with England and with a certain English traditionalism. He writes dense, difficult, elusive poetry that shows how firmly he wanted to be embedded in the literary tradition. His poetry is bursting at the seams with references, explicit or implicit, to Dante, Shakespeare, Homer, and innumerable other writers, canonical and obscure. His poetry, however, is also deeply modern in terms of the questions it explores, or maybe better, to, to put it better, the problems it wrestles with. He's concerned with the loneliness and the existential longing and the displacement that people in the modern world grapple with. His poetry is marked also by a confrontation with the industrial world of the early 20th century and the sense that human beings are detached from essential life. Eliot's poetry is experimental in many ways. And he's, a, he's an interesting figure because in some ways he's a kind of arch-traditionalist, but in other ways um, he's an avant-garde experimenter, especially formally. He generally writes what we would call free verse poetry. In other words, poetry that is unstructured by rhyme scheme or meter. And yet he demonstrates over and over again, as we'll see, that he can write formally structured verse because often in an otherwise free verse poem, he will slip into it for a couple of lines or for a dozen lines or so. And so he is constantly experimenting. He is best known uh, for Proof Rock, the poem we're going to discuss today, uh, for his probably most famous poem, The Wasteland, which we will have to take up at some point in professing literature, for the journey of the Magi, Ash Wednesday, The Hollow Men, and what many would believe his greatest work, I certainly think this, uh, the poems uh, collected um, under the heading of the four quartets. And you heard a little bit of one of the four quartets, East Coker, just now at the top of the episode. Eliot was one of the great literary critics in all of uh, literary history. He was also a profound student of philosophy and world religion. He read many languages. He was interested in Eastern traditions as well as Western traditions. Eventually, he found his way in the middle of his life to an unexpected place. He found his way into the heart of the Church of England. He had been brought up actually in a Unitarian family, but in his middle life, he had a rather profound, if sort of slow-moving, conversion that um, meant that he ended up embracing the Church of England, the Anglo-Catholic side of the Church of England with great devotion. This Christian view is explored at depth in later poems. Even in The Wasteland, which is written in the first half of the 1920s, you can see Eliot inching towards it. The poem we're talking about today, though, takes a different view of things. There are references to the scripture, there are Christian themes, 
but the emphasis is not on Christian point of view. This is a poem about anxiety and uncertainty and a longing for meaning and human connection in a world that seems to be denying those things. So as I say, it's a poem begun in 1910, completed and published in 1915, early in the, during the First World War, the war that changed civilization. And it is, loosely speaking, what we would call a dramatic monologue, which is a form of poetry that developed in the 19th century and is associated uh, most of all with a, with a poet Eliot admired greatly, Robert Browning. A dramatic monologue is a poem that is spoken by a particular character. In other words, unlike in the case of Shakespeare's sonnets or one of Keats's odes, we don't have a kind of disembodied voice speaking to us, offering us a sort of universal perspective. Instead, we have a character talking with a very defined point of view. And that character might be an actual um, historical figure. It might be a literary character taken from another work and given his own little poetic speech. It might be an imagined, dreamed-up character for the purposes of the poem, and that's what we have here. But we have a conversation that we are allowed to listen in on. It's a little bit as though you were in a room in your house and in another room someone was speaking on the telephone and you could hear one half of the conversation. You could overhear it. A dramatic monologue gives us that sense. The poem, however, is written in a style that we could more or less dub stream of consciousness, a style that is really, for many people, I think, synonymous with the modernist movement in English. In Eliot's lifetime, it's being pioneered by prose writers such as James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. He uses it here in poetry. Stream of Consciousness describes an effect where the writer doesn't, unlike, say, Jane Austen or George Eliot, clearly sort of systematically paint a picture, whether it's a picture of a, of a, of a, a, an outdoor scene or a person's interior feelings with kind of um, precise language and fully formed sentences and a sense of linear progression through an idea. In a piece of writing that's marked out by stream of consciousness, the author attempts to convey the effect of a person's interior sense of things. Because when we look around the world and think about it, you've probably noticed we don't do so in perfect, fully formed paragraphs. We have impressions. We have thoughts. They remind us of other things. We're weighed down by a conversation we had earlier in the day, and then our attention is distracted by someone across the street shouting to their friend, and that reminds us of something buried in our memories. And then we come back to the first problem we were chewing on until we're distracted again by something else. That's, that's, that's the effect that writers using this technique attempt to capture. And Eliot is more or less doing that here in Proof Rock. So I'm going to read the poem, and all of that was in order to warn you that this this is a disjointed poem in many ways, because we don't know exactly who this young man, J. Alfred Prufrock, is. We don't even know clearly, in some cases, what it is that's bothering him so much. Or if we know it, it's because of what we infer, rather than because he clearly presents it to us. We don't know if all of this is one long speech. It almost certainly is not. It is more as it is more like we are privileged to sort of watch proof rock thinking from the inside. And so it's going to seem very disjointed to you if you aren't used to this poem. But buckle up. I'll read it and um, it'll take a few minutes and then we'll work through it. So I will say um, off the top, like most of Eliot's poetry, this poem begins with an epigraph, in other words, with a quotation from another author that he uses to kind of key certain ideas, set certain ideas in motion. 
And the epigraph to Proof Rock is from Dante's Inferno, from the eighth circle of hell. Eliot, because he's T.S. Eliot, gives the epigraph in Italian, but I'm going to give it in English because I don't speak Italian. And um, I suspect my pronunciation would drive some people crazy. So I'll be giving you an epigraph in English that is actually in the poem itself given in Italian. So the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And here's the epigraph. If I but thought that my response were made to one perhaps returning to the world, this tongue of flame would cease to flicker. But since up from these depths no one has yet returned alive if what I hear is true, I answer without fear of being shamed. Guido de Montefeltro from Dante's Inferno, Canto 27. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evenings, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare, time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin, my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a further room, so how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin? to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress, arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. 
In the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worth while after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worth while if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us, and we drown. Well, um, if you found that difficult to follow, that's okay, and I don't know that everyone necessarily would have. But um, if you're not used to poetry of this sort, then it's a different kind of, of literary experience than, than something we would get from, say, Milton. But we're going to work through the poem. And roughly speaking, I'm going to work top to bottom, which is my first piece of advice for aspiring readers of poetry, trying to grapple with a piece of poetry and understand what's going on. This is pretty controversial advice, Eric, but I would say start at the beginning, then move to the middle, and then finish at the end. And so I'll try to model that as we go. It's not the only way to do an analysis of a poem like this, but I thought for today it might work pretty well. So let's take a look. Let's begin with the title of the poem. It's a wonderful title for this poem. Initially, while he was working on it, Eliot gave it a different title, a title that is kind of useful maybe for telling us what's going on, but it's an inferior title. He called the poem Proof Rock Among the Women at first, and then he made a telling alteration. He changed the title of the poem to The Love Song of J. Alfred Proof Rock. And if you just aren't paying attention, that might not mean very much to you. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. We have a wonderful disjunction within that simple title, that short sentence. Well, it's not a sentence, but that, that descriptor 
the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Because, of course, the name of the character is about as unlikely a name as you could choose for someone who was going to sing a love song. That first phrase, the love song of, takes us to the world of the medieval troubadours or the Tudor Stuart love lyricists or to the Romantic era. We have expectations of romance, maybe of the fantastic. And then we get this name, J. Alfred Prufrock. And the J, I should mention, it's not the name J, J J-A-Y, as in J. Gatsby. It's the initial J, J. Alfred Prufrock. I offended a few weeks ago um, when we were talking about 1984, people named Smith, um, although I didn't mean to. So I'm going to do an even worse um, by anyone named Alfred or Prufrock. But this is not the name of a romantic hero. It's a name that seems to disappoint what is promised in that opening phrase, the love song, J. Alfred Prufrock. Prufrock in particular is a name that suggests fussiness. It suggests that the speaker is effete or kind of um, weak or harmless. Again, not claiming that in real life, someone who was named Prufrock couldn't be a kind of powerful, confident, erotically successful person. But the name, unlike the name, um, I don't know, the last name Steele or Wild or something like that, the name Prufrock, already is giving us a little bit of a picture. And then the fact that he has done, you know, he, he sounds, in terms of the way he has set up his name, he doesn't sound like the singer of a love song. He sounds like a lawyer. He doesn't call himself even Alfred Prufrock. Instead, we have that middle initial stuck there on the front, as though we're reading his business card, J. Alfred Prufrock. So already, we begin to form a sort of picture of this character. And it will be a picture that I think is confirmed by the poem that follows, but not in any straightforward way. So as I said, I'm going to try to work through this top to bottom, and we'll see how we do. We begin with an invitation, and it's a rather confident, assertive invitation although the poem that follows will show that confidence and assertiveness are the last thing that this person can really lay claim to. Let us go then, you and I, is the opening line of the poem. So we are, inv- we are invited by the speaker of the poem, and we're invited into something confidential, something just between the two of us. One of the great questions of this poem is the kind of audience we're supposed to be imagining for Prufrock's um, address. It very clearly is not a large audience or even an audience made of multiple people. There's a kind of one-on-one conversation happening here. And yet we don't know who the other person that that he's speaking to, we don't know to whom he is speaking. Let us go then you and I but we don't have a clear sense of ourselves as standing in the place of a specific character. Are we to imagine that the poem that follows is the result of a kind of long rambling walk of a character pouring out his guts? It certainly seems at times as though there's a strongly confessional tone in this poem. He's telling us secrets that he wouldn't tell anyone else. And yet, an even stronger possibility, it seems to me, at least as I read it, is that Prufrock isn't actually having a conversation with anyone. He's talking to himself, or he's talking maybe to an imaginary interlocutor as he's wandering around, or as he's sitting listlessly, imagining what he would like to tell someone. But the poem is so disjointed and broken up 
that it's hard to imagine that Elliot wants us to think of this as, as a sort of conversation as we would understand it between two people. Nothing wrong with picturing it in your mind that way, if you like. But this is just to say that we begin with this kind of clarity in the first line of a speaker proposing a conversation and you, the reader or the listener, being allowed to sort of stand in the place of one of the conversation partners. But that's going to be challenged and broken up. And so we don't know who this you that he's addressing is. And that's okay. But let us go then, you and I. Off we go with Proof Rock. He's going to tell us things that he can't tell anyone else. And we're tipped off to that fact by what I referred to earlier as the epigraph, the epigraph from Dante. Um, this is a brilliant and fascinating six lines of poetry to use as the epigraph to this poem. And so I'll talk about it a little bit now, because the first line, I think, invites me to. And I'll give you a little bit of context. Dante is in hell on his pilgrimage, his journey. The Divine Comedy of, of Dante Alighieri tells the story of Dante, the character, on a journey through hell, purgatory, and heaven, a spiritual journey in which he'll learn deep Christian truths. But the first part of the journey is hell, and it is terrible because he goes down through the nine circles of hell and has conversations with various sinners who are suffering various kinds of punishment. And near the bottom of hell, he is in a part reserved for false counselors. In other words, those who on earth had sinned by telling lies under the cloak of, of advice, of de uh, dissembling, in order to manipulate. And so that's already very interesting that this epigraph is coming for someone who is damned for false counsel on earth. So how trustworthy is it? But notice what he says. He says, this is the character Guido de Montefeltro, who Dante meets in the eighth circle of hell, whose punishment is to be imprisoned in a flame because a tongue of flame, excuse me, because he had misused his tongue on earth by offering false counsel. So in hell, he is punished by being trapped in a tongue of flame. And Dante, as he does throughout the inferno, comes up to this sinner who's being punished and asks if he can talk to him. And the sinners usually want to talk. Some of them are quite proud of what they've done, although not all of them. And Dante comes up to Guido and wants to talk. And Guido says, if I but thought that my response were made to one perhaps returning to the world, this tongue of flame would cease to flicker. In other words, Guido takes it for granted, as he'll then go on to say, that no one gets out of hell. I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're down here. If I thought that you were going to get out of hell, I wouldn't say anything to you because I wouldn't want it told about me. I wouldn't want it relayed back on earth. But since, of course, no one gets out of hell, yeah, I will speak to you. I will tell you who I am and what I did. So talk about establishing a confessional tone. Eliot is here referring to this scene in Inferno where Dante wants to know the secrets of this man. And the man says, I'll talk to you only because I know you won't ever get out of hell and share my conversation with those above, not realizing that Dante is on a pilgrimage through hell and that he will eventually come back to earth and write down everything that he's heard. And so there's a sense here, you know, Guido, Guido had been a great criminal. He had been someone who had falsely advised, I think, the Pope, Pope Boniface VIII, if I remember, and so was being punished for it. And he doesn't want it known up there in the sunlit lands what it is that he has done. But he will tell Dante in this moment because he assumes that Dante himself can never get back to the surface. And that is this little thematic nugget, the, this little literary nugget that we have at the beginning of this poem to key us to these themes. And so already there are themes here of a private conversation, 
of a confession, of a confession of something shameful and deeply personal, and of a kind of hellish suffering. It's not going too far, maybe, to suggest that Prufrock, the speaker, is in a kind of hell, feels himself trapped, stifled, punished, unable to escape. So we are invited to go with him. Let us go then, you and I. And then you have one of the most famous lines of 20th century poetry. And really, there is no poem in the 20th century, I think, that is more chock full of famous lines than this one. The ragged claws, I am not Prince Hamlet. Will I wear my trousers rolled, measured out my life with coffee spoons, etc., etc., etc. We have a big one early on. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. Beautiful phrase. We're, we're setting out at evening time, at the twilight, at a time when confidences could be shared, when the sun is down low on the horizon and it's starting to get dim and we might feel we can talk. It's beautifully phrased. When the evening is spread out against the sky, and then something completely unexpected happens, like a patient etherized upon a table. It is one of the most well-known, because it is one of the most disarming and unexpected similes, uses of figurative language in all of English poetry. Uh, the evening is compared to a patient etherized, anesthetized, we would say, upon a table. It's a kind of gruesome twist that the image makes. It's the sort of thing that if someone says something like that, we immediately wonder what's going on and is that person okay? You know, that they compared this thing of maybe beauty or, or you know, perhaps just a straightforward or unremarkable object to this kind of grisly or unexpected object. Why would he compare the evening sky to a patient etherized upon a table? Why would he see it this way? Why do, what does it mean? Well, I might disappoint you when I say that I don't have a good answer to that. It's an enigma, and clearly a deliberate enigma. And I don't think it's there to be solved. It suggests things about proof rock, perhaps a certain morbidity. Perhaps it is a kind of projection, as we would say. He is not unlike an etherized or anesthetized patient. He is emotionally immobilized. And unable to, you know, he is the kind of passive victim, as he sees it, of life and of other people, and can't act, but can only be acted upon. So perhaps there's something there. But beyond that, I don't have, uh, you know, that that's conjectural. He invites us again, let us go through certain half-deserted streets, and he describes the kind of walk we're going to take in conversation. And it's a walk that seems to lead into a squalid part of town. This is not a man from the squalid part of town. It's quite clear from a number of things he says in the poem. First of all, that this is an educated man. If not a deeply educated man, he's an educated man. He's a cultured man. And he's a man of, I would say, the kind of upper middle classes, in the early 20th century in either England or America, where, you know, I think of this as a London poem. It may be, it may not be. Eliot was not that far removed from America, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Harvard when, when he was working on it. So you can imagine it wherever you like it. But he's clearly not a man of the working classes, and yet he's inviting us into neighborhoods that are sort of rough, certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels. So this is an area of shabbiness and squalor and transience that he's inviting us into. Sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, sawdust on the floor of the restaurants, presumably, and oyster shells that are dropped and not picked up, especially especially actively by the staff. So kind of squalid, slovenly restaurants and hotels. And a neighborhood where streets follow like a tedious argument of, of insidious intent. We're going to go wandering through this part of town in the evening into the night. 
down streets that are twisted like a twisted argument could be twisted, which is maybe a way of tipping us off to what is going to come, which is a twisted sort of statement that isn't clear and that isn't defined and that may be insidious. And then we have a sense of the listener pushing back, querying, because Eliot says, oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. And there we are, the end of the first verse paragraph. We have been, been invited to go on this walk to have this conversation. We're expecting now something concrete. I have something to say. Come and walk with me. Here is where we will walk down into the kind of lower class bowels of the city. And, you know, I need to speak to you. I need to speak to you. There is, you know, strong sense of loneliness in this first verse paragraph as he describes these hotels where people just pass through them one night only, transiently. And then you, the listener, are sort of about to say, well, what is it? And he says, don't ask, don't ask. He defers the answer, and he's going to do that throughout the poem because he's never going to clearly define what it is that he's trying to talk about. So this is the first of many deferrals. Leads you to an overwhelming question. You want to ask me something, and I don't want to answer it right now. So there's this deferral of something enormous, overwhelming, as he says. And it gives us a sense of deflation at the end of the verse paragraph. But let's go on our walk. And we might expect now at this point that things would slowly become clear, that now that we are out on our walk, if that's how you want to imagine this, now that we're moving, now that he's begun, we will start to have clarity. And instead of clarity, we're given enigma. The next two lines, another very famous phrase from the poem. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. We do not know what he means there. It's an important enough phrase that he's going to repeat it 20 lines later. Exactly the same phrase offset from the rest of the text by white space. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. What on earth does that mean? We assume he means Michelangelo Buonarroti, the Florentine Renaissance artist. No reason not to think that. But what is he talking about? This is a complete change of gear. I was talking about the effect of stream of consciousness, and, and notice this is, this is the way we experience our own thoughts if we're paying attention. You're driving to the grocery store, you're listening to the sports talk radio about a football game or something like that, you're thinking about it, then you start without even noticing it, getting weighed down, reminded by a conversation you had with your sister and that it's bothering you. And then the next thing you know, you're thinking about your sister's dog and how much you miss your own dog that died two years ago. And then all of a sudden you snap back in and you realize that they're talking about how the uh, fullback is not going to be recovered from his ankle injury in time for the game on Saturday. That's how we experience our own kind of thought life. And something like that is maybe going on here because all of a sudden we have this statement about the women, whoever they are, talking about Michelangelo. And I will come back to this. I, I, I will have some thoughts about what is maybe being meant or suggested by this passage. But there it is for now. And then we move on to this description of the fog which has to be one of the reasons why it makes me think of coal-burning London in the early 20th century with its famous fogs. We have a description of yellow fog lying among the buildings and in the streets. And the fog is described in feline terms, as though it's a cat. It rubs its back upon the window panes, just as we've all seen cats doing. It rubs its muzzle on the window panes. It licks its tongue into the corners of the evening. Wonderful phrase. 
the fog is kind of writhing around the buildings. I don't know quite what Elliot is trying to do here. It gives a suggestion of a kind of predatory threat, maybe, in the night, in the world. Although maybe the cat is more playful than predatory, rubbing its back, rolling around. And then it goes to sleep. It's an image of a city or at least a neighborhood in the evening quiet, in the nighttime quiet, settling down. And the world, this fog, this sort of natural thing, or at least quasi-natural thing, settling down with it. But we don't know exactly what it means. Forgive me, I'm going to say things like that repeatedly as we talk about this poem. So we've had this invitation to a big conversation. We've had this interruption where he mentions the women and Michelangelo. And then we've had this description of the fog, setting the mood, perhaps. He changes again in the next verse paragraph. And all of a sudden, it sounds as though Prufrock is coming back. You know, the way you might in a conversation, you're, you're talking with a friend and you're talking about a specific subject, maybe the new sofa sectional, you're thinking about buying something like that, or having to take your child to t-ball later tonight, and a couple of other topics sort of come up and are shuffled through, and then you're like, yeah, and about the t-ball, and you come back to it. And we have that effect here, we have that sense here, because all of a sudden Prufrock seems to be reconnecting to an earlier conversation or an earlier phase in this conversation. He says, and indeed there will be time. What does that mean? And indeed there will be time. And this is an idea that recurs throughout the poem of having time, of having enough time, or even of having too much time. Any literary critic worth his salt will tell you that this is a reference to a very famous poem from the 17th century by Andrew Marvell, a poem we might look at at one point, although it's rather R-rated, so I don't know if we'll get away with that on our family show, Eric. Uh, but it's a great poem, Andrew Marvell to his coy mistress, which begins with the immortal lines, Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. The speaker of that poem is trying to argue with a woman that he wants to sleep with and convince her to go to bed with him. It is a carpe diem poem, which anyone who has watched what is the movie Dead Poets Society will know about Carpe Diem, seize the day, this long poetic tradition going back to the Romans, suggesting that we have to get the juice out of life while we can, because we're going to die. Because we are going to die and turn to dust, we need to act now. We need to gather our rosebuds, as another Carpe Diem poet, Robert Herrick, put it so famously, gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. So Marvell begins his poem by conceding to the woman that he's speaking to, or by saying to her, if we had world enough and time, you could be coy. And then he goes on to say, if we lived forever, then I'd be happy to play this little fr flirtatious game with you for thousands of years. That would be no problem. I'd be all patience, but we don't. We're going to die. And therefore, we need to take our pleasure while we can. It's an interesting poem to allude to here because we're going to see that the speaker of this poem has a very different hang-up. He is not trying to convince a woman to sleep with him. He is all but immobilized, all but paralyzed, etherized by the idea of talking to a woman. And so for him, time is not a space to act in. It is a space to defer action in. And so he says there will be time. Perhaps I don't have to act right now because there will be time. There will be time later. Time for the yellow smoke that he was just talking about that slides along the street, etc., etc. There will be time. There will be time. Repetition equals emphasis in poetry. And he's just repeated himself twice over. There will be time. There will be time. And then a remarkable line. Time for what? Well, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Brilliant single-line description of our social lives. 
prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, to put on the mask, the persona, so that you can stand before the world and not be known and recognized for who you truly are. Human beings are mask-wearing creatures. We perform for one another. And sometimes dangerously, we perform for ourselves. We put masks on for ourselves. But there will be time to get that mask on, to prepare that face to meet the faces that you meet. This speaker is someone who has profound trouble with authentic connection. And so one of the things, you know, all of us wear masks at different times, you know, when we're visiting an older relative, maybe that we haven't seen in years and we don't want to, you know, we maybe want to sand down some of what they would perceive as our rough edges or when we're talking to our boss or when we're talking to the person who works for us or when we're talking to someone at the bank, we clean ourselves up, we adjust ourselves in order to appear a certain way. Proofrock does a lot of this. And then, you know, all of a sudden, that's, that's maybe clear enough. And then we're told there will be time to murder and create, which is getting pretty heavy. For everything, there is a season, the preacher says in the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, there is the time to kill. Um, there is the time of birth. There is the time of laughter. There is the time of mourning. There is the time to gather stones together and throw stones away. There will be time to murder and create. Proof rock, I do not think. I'm sure I could dig around a little bit on the internet and find, you know, people reading this poem as though it's the twisted confession of a serial killer or something like that. Proof rock is not a murderer, if you're asking my opinion. He's generalizing here about human experience, killing and, and, and living, murdering and creating. And he says, time for all the works and days of hands, which is a strange phrase, but it's actually a reference to the Greek poet Hesiod's 8th century poem, The Works and Days, which is a famous Greek poem, a long poem about agriculture. Hesiod describes the agricultural life in that poem and gives us this kind of moving and charming picture of archaic Greek life, traditional community life. And that's something that Prufrock doesn't have because Prufrock is a man who is cut off from the world, from the earth. And so he has time, he says, he has time. But it becomes clear that although there is time for everything, he wants the time in order that he can do nothing. Because although there is, he says, time for you and time for me, there is time yet for a hundred indecisions. It's a great way of describing, I think, the, the, the texture of life for some people, at least of a certain temperament. Time to twist and change the mind and to be caught halfway and to be indecisive and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea before the taking of a toast and tea, this is someone from polite society. He's not necessarily wealthy, but it's clear that he's well-bred and that his life is arranged around little social rituals. As he will say a few lines later, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, right? Not with, you know, animals that I've hunted and killed, not with career accomplishments, not with romantic conquests, not with books I've read, not with church services that I've attended, but with coffee spoons. They are the milestones the, um, in his life. And so even before we have the toast and tea, I have time for a hundred visions and revisions. Great phrasing. A hundred visions and revisions. I can waffle I can go back and forth. I can imagine things and then back out of them. That's what I have time for. And then Eliot, for the second time, hits us with this phrase that we've already seen in the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And we're maybe starting to get a better sense of what that enigmatic phrase means. 
not a sharp crystal clear sense, but a little bit of a better formed sense. This is a young man who is hung up on the issue of women. He is fascinated by them. He is watching them. He is aware of them all the time. He is listening to them, but he is cut off from them. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. After mentioning these women, he comes back to a previous phrase. Proofrock, you will notice, repeats himself. He doesn't very often repeat full sentences. Sometimes he does. He often repeats half sentences or individual phrases. And he does that here, as though he's agreeing with something he has said a couple of minutes before, before the women and Michelangelo came up once again. He says, and indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? This is the torment of the indecisive person to wonder if I can, not, not if I can do something, but if I can attempt to do something, to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Well, what is it he wants, us, he wants to do? What is it that he wants to dare? It might be many different things. It may be unwise to suggest a singular answer for that, but certainly one of the most prominent things that he wants and that he wants to dare for, although he doesn't believe he can, but one of them involves attempting to make a connection with a woman. Do I dare and do I dare? Why can't he do this? What's the problem? Why can't he walk up to a girl at one of these afternoon tea parties or morning coffee hours and say, I don't know, what's, uh, what's one of your better lines, Eric? Um, you know, like I always thought, uh, do you like music? <laughs> was uh, <laughs> did was that, pretty did effective that conversation starter. Oh, I don't know, but um, you know, it's uh, it, uh, it, it was there in the pocket if I ever needed it. But um, yeah, do you have any solid gold uh, uh, in case we've got a nineteen-year-old young no, man? I, yeah, I, I, I probably don't remember, um, but uh, you know, I, I always think of you know, hey, what's your sign? Okay, Isn't that's that, solid. That was like yeah. I know that was seventies that uh, that 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 became big, but yeah. still, you could play that out back and forth for half an hour. Yeah, um, if yeah. she was into astrology. Yeah, yeah. so that's yeah. that's good advice. All right, make a note of that. Anyone who's uh, hung up on whether uh, the person they're romantically interested in can be talked to, but that is part of what proof rock, at least, is longing for: is that connection. Do I dare? Well, why wouldn't he dare? What's the big deal? What's the worst that could happen? What is the worst that could happen? She's not interested in you. Try, try again. But this is someone who is so hung up with his sense of his own inadequacies that that answer cannot land with him. And look at how he imagines the way they imagine him in the lines that follow. Once again, we're talking about time, time to turn back and descend the stair, right? As though there was time to go up that staircase, perhaps towards a possible conversation, but there's also time to turn around and rethink it and to back off. With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. I know how they would look at me, and I know the things they would whisper about me. Prufrock is fussy about his appearance. Throughout, we get a sense of the clothes he wears or maybe will wear, and he likes the way he's dressed in his imagination right now. He's got a sort of portrait of himself in his imagination, and he's doing everything he can do. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. He is looking every inch, the dapper, proper, respectable, well-turned-out Edwardian gentleman. But that hair is thin. That, you know, they'll be noticing that. If he goes back down the stairs, they will see the bald spot. 
And they will also notice uh, his arms and legs are getting thin. Proof rock is not a beefy, is not beefy. Proof rock is not bull necked. Proof rock is not a man's man. Proof rock is conscious of his own physical inadequacies. That doesn't mean we should imagine he's ugly and repellent. He might not have an accurate self image, but he imagines other people looking at him and seeing weakness and inadequacy and a kind of premature aging. And so better turn around and go down those stairs, even though I can imagine what they would be whispering to one another. It doesn't even sound as though these women are trying to be cruel. They're just doing what people do, saying, oh, he's, he's, his hair's getting thin. Aren't his arms and legs thin? Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. Do I dare disturb the universe? There's something grandiose, something maybe even narcissistic about this character, right? A healthy person will say, I want to talk to that other person, and I'm ready to take my lumps if she's not interested. You know, I'll be disappointed. I might even be a little hurt or embarrassed if I ask for her number and she says, no, thank you. But life goes on. She doesn't owe me anything. I don't owe her anything either. So I can ask her for this and we can give it a try. And if she's not interested, I hope she's polite, but no hard feelings. A narcissist, and you can be narcissistic with a feeling of deep inferiority as well as a feeling of excessive superiority. A narcissist imagines that that would disturb the universe. But for me to get shot down when I ask for a phone number or when I request a promotion, maybe, is shaking the very foundations of the cosmos. That's narcissistic. That is self-obsession. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. I don't have to disturb the universe today. I can fantasize about maybe talking to her tomorrow or next week. I've got time. He doesn't have time. His arms and legs are getting thin. His hair is getting thin. He can feel, again, this narcissism, this self-obsession that makes him focus on himself unhealthily means that he can almost feel himself aging. He doesn't have time. But he tells himself in the moment, I've got time, just the way we do. Just the way we do. Can start eating right tomorrow. Can start worrying about my finances next month after I get paid, whatever it is, I've got time. I've got time. But every time we say, I've got time, of course, we've burned a little bit more time. And so he wants things from this life, and he wants them deeply. But he is so preoccupied and so worried about shame and about the way he looks that he won't allow himself to reach out and attempt to get them. I'm running long on time for this episode, but I will try and take us quickly through the next three, I won't even call them verse paragraphs because they're almost quasi stanzas, because they've got a certain imperfect rhyme scheme that is repeated and a lot of phrasing that is repeated, and they are wonderful. They're one of the strongest parts of the poem for me. I won't reread them fully because I've already read them once, but we have three stanzas, using the term loosely, that describe something that Prufrock says he has known already. I have known already, known them all. What is it, the all? What, is the, what, are, what are the all? Are they moments, opportunities? Are they individual women? What are these things that he has known already? Maybe all of those things bundled together. He says, I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. And then you get that great line, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. The idea of a life constructed around polite society and around the rituals of polite society, of, of dinner invitations given and received. Perhaps he is the son of a family 
that does a lot of entertaining. He's invited to go and have morning coffee or to have supper at someone else's house. These invitations are returned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he has been in the mix, he says. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a, from a further room. I've been in these situations. I've been in these environments. I've been on the fringe of these conversations. You know, he is not a solitary shepherd living on a hill in Scotland with only his sheep for company. He mixes with people in polite society, and he has chances for connection. And you don't even th have to think of proof rock as wanting sex or marriage or something like that if you don't want to. It might be simple connection. The intimacy of a conversation with a genuine friend of the type that he's trying to have here in his love song. But he's been in these opportunities and he says, so how should I presume? Well, presume to what? Presume to say something clearly or to ask for something. He can't do it though. And then we have repetition and variation in the next stanza. I have known the eyes already, he says. I have known the eyes already presumably women's eyes. He has looked into women's eyes. Well, what's the problem? Women's eyes can be very attractive. Well, they are the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. These are the eyes that look at you in judgment, that fix you. The women in question may be doing no such thing. Perhaps they are simply listening to this young man politely, perhaps even with interest, but they are looking at him seriously, and he feels a kind of violation when they do so. How can I speak to them honestly? How can I be open? I have known the eyes already, and they are eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and that is terrifying. They look at me, they see me, they see me, they see my thin arms and legs. They see that I'm weedy and unmasculine. And so when they look at me, he compares it to being an insect stuck on a pin in a, you know, on a cork board or something like that by a bug collector, like a butterfly under glass stuck on a pin. As I said before, this is someone who doesn't feel he can act, but only feels acted upon. He is passive to the bottom of his shoes. And so if I were stuck on that pin, if she really looked at me, if I said, I beg your pardon, can I have a few minutes of your time? And she really looked at me, how could I say anything to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, the butt ends, the bottom of the wine butt, the barrel, or maybe it's the cigarette butt? You know, how could I show her this weakness and insufficiency, this kind of pitiful collection of, of things that make up my life when she's looking at me like that. And then we have the third of these three stanzas. I love this. I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. It's a gorgeous, close study in a few lines of a woman's bare arms, right? He sees. Prufrock's problem is not that he's tuned out. He observes carefully, and he knows the arms already. This is a stanza, if you like, the first stanza of these three is about apathy and about routine. I have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, the coffee spoons, etc., etc., the second stanza about the eyes that would fix you in a formulated phrase is about fear, that I would be looked at, that I would be studied and known. The final one where he talks about the arms is about desire, about the beauty of a woman's arms in the lamplight, presumably in the evening when she's in an evening dress of some kind and so has bare arms. Arms that lie along a table and wrap about a shawl. And as he says, once again, how and should I then presume? How could I do it? Fear and desire mingled in him. 
and he is incapacitated. He's known the eyes already. And the dangerous thing about those eyes is that they look back at him. Prufrock is good at observing, but he's terrified of being observed. You know, if he's observed, then the truth might be known. And the truth is that, as he imagines it, he's not adequate. But he's also filled with desire. He wants to look at those arms. He wants those arms to be wrapped around his neck, not just wrapped about a shawl. But there's too much time. There's too much time to defer. Proof rock, and we're here at the end of our time for this episode. We will continue with his story in a little while in part two. But proof rock is someone who is cut off from the world, cut off from what he hopes will give him meaning. He is unable to act. I tend to read this poem, as you can probably already tell, as though his primary issue that he's um, wrestling with is a very simple one and straightforward one. He is unable to make romantic connection. Maybe I'm overstressing that, I don't know. But it is not simply about romantic connection. That's what it's about for me. But that is bringing up a whole host of other issues that have to do with connection to community, to the world, to a source of meaning. Because the modern world, as T.S. Eliot presents it to us, is a place where we are atomized, where we are cut off, where all of us are on little islands of solitude, and we can't reach out and form the bonds and be nourished by others and nourish others in a way that is authentic and wholesome and life-giving and natural to human beings. As we began the episode, we read what I think is a tremendous passage from the second of the four quartets, East Coker. Eliot describes being out on a country road in England in the evening. The van goes past towards the town. There are flowers. You wait, he says, for the early owl to begin hooting. And he's in the countryside, or his speaker is in the countryside. And he says, in that open field, if you do not come too close, if you do not come too close something can happen out in the countryside on a summer night. What is it that can happen? You can hear the music of the weak pipe and the little drum. This is the pipe and tabor, the traditional rustic instruments of English country life prior to the Industrial Revolution. The simple instruments that would be played at village at church, at church ales, at festivals, and at weddings. The weak pipe and the little drum. You can hear that music in the field. Uh, not literally. He's suggesting to us that there is a kind of spiritual possibility that can open up. If you do not come too close, in other words, if you don't try too hard to have it, you can be touched in the countryside on the right evening at the right time by this sense of a lingering presence that is still there to be accessed. And what he goes on to describe is a kind of wedding festival, that you can see these people, your own ancestors from the distant past, dancing around the bonfire in a sort of traditional rite of marriage, what he calls rather formally in the next line, the association of man and woman. And he then goes on, he slips into a late medieval or early 16th century idiom in the next lines as he describes in dancing, signifying matrimony, a dignified and commodious sacrament, right? That's what marriage is from this point of view. It's a sacrament. It's a ritual that is divinely sanctioned and that is full of divine possibility for human beings. It's a dignified and commodious sacrament, two and two, two people coming together. What he calls, again, still in his late medieval diction, 
Um, and you can see on the page, the spelling is usually kind of late medieval or early modern. Eliot writes it as though to advertise to us that he's using old-fashioned phrasing, necessary conjunction, holding each other by the hand or the arm, which betokeneth concord, round and round the fire. So you can hear this music, you can see these two dancing around the fire, holding on to one another, and it is a sacramental thing, and it is, he says, a necessary thing. And it is a thing of concord. There is an idealization here in this passage of East Coker about the age-old perennial coming together of the sexes. It's procreative, and it's also psychologically and emotionally fortifying. It betokeneth concord. It is difference coming together. And our ancestors over innumerable generations danced around their fires to the little pipe and drum and came together, were married, had children, propagated the species, and then what did they do? They went down into the earth. They died. But they were doing something that was part of the eternal round of life and death, of birth, of marriage, round and round and round. And the picture that Eliot paints here in East Coker of this traditional sort of ceremony that, that his speaker suggests you can tap into uh, if the time is right on the right evening of the year and the weather is just right, you can hear in the distance that little pipe and drum this is something that on the one hand is incredibly earthy because he goes on to say these bodies that are getting married now are nourished and supported and lifted by the mirth of other bodies that have been long since under the earth. You know, their ancestors who now fertilize the fields as their bodies go back to the earth. Um, it's something incredibly earthy, but it's also something that is full of spiritual plenitude. It is earthy and it is spiritual. This union, this tradition, this sacrament. And Prufrock, notice this from this earlier poem, 20 years previously, 25 years previously, is neither earthy nor spiritual. Prufrock does not get his hands dirty. Prufrock is disconnected from the soil. He's a, a city dweller, and he's a city dweller who is sort of, we're, we're led to understand, sort of fussy and picky about his appearance. He is attracted to those squalid alleyways in the bad part of town, but it's not where he belongs. There's nothing earthy about proof rock. He doesn't know anything, not just that he doesn't know anything about farming, but he doesn't know anything about physical reality. He just looks and watches. He doesn't experience. But he's also not spiritual. He's neither earthy nor spiritual. And it's suggested by Eliot that our ancestors were both and that we suffer when we are proof rocks who are neither earthy nor spiritual. Because the human being is supposed to have his feet on the ground, preferably in the grass, and his head looking up at the sky. In other words, he is supposed to be both in touch, to use a silly contemporary phrase, in touch with physical reality, and also in touch, or at least aspiring towards spiritual reality. But Prufrock is a quintessentially modern figure, because his obsession is with neither of those things, but is with himself and how he looks and whether or not someone will think ill of him if he says too much or reveals too much. And so he is not someone who is connected to the ancestral ways. Um, we don't know anything about his family, anything about where he came from. He just appears before us as this sort of quintessential modern liberal subject who kind of 
as Milton Satan imagines of himself, he kind of burst into being by sheer force of his own will and is connected to no one. And he's also not sensitive or even aspiring towards a spiritual beyond of any kind, a kind of transcendence. And so instead he passes time. That's what he can do. Um, he can while away the days. If they had video games in 1911, Prufrock would be playing them eight hours a day. Instead, he has to go through these little social rituals that anesthetize him, that, e that um, etherize him, but that don't satisfy him. I think that's enough for now. We will come back and talk about the second half of this poem and go deeper into Prufrock's condition next time. But in the meantime, on behalf of Eric Williams, this is David Anderson saying thank you for being with us and take care.